Well, thank you for being here tonight. I, uh, I want to share with you uh, some more about are we living in the last days. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24 and just orient there for a while. I uh, received a lovely little card last Sunday night, and part of the card said, Thank you for preparing us for the future. And uh, the only way I can prepare for the future is what God's already said. So if you have Matthew 24, we're going to look at just three verses to begin with. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to him. And the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said to them, Do you not... And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? And surely I said to you, Not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So they're talking about Herod's temple. We have a picture we're going to put up of that temple. And uh, if you look at that temple, it's a tremendous, massive work that Herod had the people build. That Temple Mount area is about 36 acres. So if you look at it, and it seems like it's very small, Think about a 36-acre uh, acre plot, and there the temple, the wall, and the temple mount. I, I've actually been on that mount. Of course, none of that was there when, <laughs> when I was there. But John chapter 2 tells us it took 46 years to build that. So in 46 years, they built that. Now Jesus is telling them there will not be one stone left upon another uh, of that complex. So what are the signs and the times of the end of the age? Verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age. Now the question is, is Jesus going to come again? And the answer is, absolutely yes. Now let me pose this to you. If we believe the prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ, that he was going to be born of the Virgin, going to be in Bethlehem, that he is going to be at a place where uh, he's going to be at the temple, he's going to be crucified, and all those things actually happen. And we believe that. So if we believe in the first coming, that he was going to be born in Bethlehem and be born of the Virgin, then should we not believe the second coming? So if we believe the first, we believe in the second. So he was asked, what is going to be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Now, does the Bible just definitely, point blank, say Jesus is coming? So let me take you through just the book of Revelation first. Revelation 1-7, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the people of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now that's chapter 1 of Revelation. This is verse 8. I am the Alpha, the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 3.11, he's speaking to the church at Philadelphia. I am coming soon, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Now this is Revelation 22, so 22 is the last chapter of the Bible. So let's look at it, verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 12, and behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Jesus said he's coming again, and he's coming quickly. Paul said Jesus was coming again. Peter said Jesus was coming again. Daniel prophesied that Jesus was coming again. Listen to the words of Daniel. This is chapter 17, verses 13 through 14. I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So Daniel said he was coming. Jesus said he was coming. Paul said he was coming. Peter saying he's coming. I'm saying Jesus is coming. What do you think? In the mouth of two or three witnesses. Now this is what we know about the time we live in. There's going to be the majority of people in our world today that does not believe Jesus is going to come again. This is 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? 
For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now this is what the skeptics are saying. The world's always been this way. The world's always going to go this way. He's not coming. I'm not, I'm not uh, definite that he's going to come. And they're going to scoff and they're going to mock about us believing that Jesus Christ is coming again. But I believe the Word of God, I think you believe the Word of God, no matter what the world says or the, the scoffers say or the skeptics say, Jesus Christ is going to come again. And we have to be ready for that coming. As I drove in this afternoon, I was about 3 o'clock, I was driving in, and I, I just noticed as I was driving down the road, people were mowing their yard, people going to the lake, and, and people were pulling in, getting gas for their car for the, the rest of the week. And nothing wrong with all those things. I was just thinking that everybody's busy. Everybody's going on with their daily uh, you know, uh, duties. They're, they're going on with their life. And the Bible tells us that his coming is going to catch so many people unaware, they're going to be absolutely shocked. You know, the, the word references there's going to be two working in the field, one taken, one left. There are going to be two sleeping in the same bed, one taken, one left. Uh, two grinding at the mill. We don't have many mill grinders uh, today, so we updated it. Two ladies shopping at Walmart, one taken, one left. So the world's going to be going on with their regular duties, right? Uh, as it was in the days of Noah. They're marrying, giving in marriage, they're, they're doing the things that they're normally doing, and then boom, all of a sudden, you know, the world came to an end as they knew it. Now, if I go back to what Peter said in verses 3 and 4, where is the sign and the promise of his coming? The next verse, and I, I didn't put it up for you, but the next verse says they forgot about the flood. They forgot about Noah. Life was going on, just like it had always gone on, and boom, then the flood happened, and many of them, and most of them perished. So in Matthew 24, we have the signs of his coming. This is verse 4, if you have your Bible. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So he begins to delineate the signs of the last days. So here's the first one. We talked about this last week pretty much uh, exhaustively, but we're going to just touch on it again tonight. The first one is deception. Say that with me. Deception. We live in a very deceptive age. I, uh, I, I, I'm a watcher. I, I'm a noticer of things. I don't know if you've noticed, but even the commercials today are giving us the agenda that they want for the culture. Now, you, you, you need to listen to what I'm saying. Used to, used to be, you know, people are propagating the, the culture they want you to buy into. Now, the commercials are really promoting that. The next time you watch a commercial, you just begin to notice the people in that commercial and the activities in that commercial, not just what they're selling, but the things that they are trying to promote in the middle of the commercial. It's very suggestive. Uh, it, it's, it's bowling the frog. We talked about that last time. Uh, they're setting us up for what they want us to do and how they want us to respond. Now, you may not believe that. You're wrong, but I'm right. Just telling you. They're setting us up. They're conditioning us. Uh, Daryl and I talked the other day. I, I did this Saturday. Uh, I'm getting ready to get some cattle up to go sell. And uh, it's the middle of the summer. So what I started doing Saturday is going out and taking feed and feeding the cows and calling them up. I normally don't do that in the summer because, you know, this year they have a lot to eat. But what am I doing? I'm conditioning them. I'm getting them ready so that they will go into the lot for the food. And I'm going to shut the gate and some of them are going to go on and they're going to be at McDonald's. Now, I'm absolutely conditioning them for the response that I want from them. 
And the world is conditioning you and I, if we let it, for the response that they want us to respond. And we have to be careful that we don't buy in to that culture. Uh, somebody at least say amen. So, deception. Now, Jesus said part of this deception was that many will say that I am the Christ. Not that he is the Christ. We're saying that Jesus is the Christ. And the word Christ is the Greek version of Messiah. So he's saying some people are going to come along and say, I am the Messiah. Let me just give you a little stat here. 21 people have claimed to be the Messiah since 1900 just in the Christian faith. Eight Muslim messianic claims have been given from the 1400s to the 1950s. Ten various messianic claimants in the 20th and 21st century. There have always been people who said they were the Messiah. And this is going to get worse because there is going to be one that really rises up and claims to be the Christ and Messiah, and the world is going to follow him. Now, all of these people that I just mentioned had a following. National Geographic just put an article out not too long ago, five people who say that they are the Messiah today, and they listed those people in a National Geographic article and many people follow all five of these people because they believe that they are the Messiah. Now listen, he's not coming in the desert, he's not in the secret chamber, he's coming in the clouds. That's how he's coming. So you and I need to understand that we need to get that down. Here's the second thing, wars and rumors of wars. In World War I, there was about 37 and a half million people killed in World War I. It was the war to end all wars until World War II came along. Uh, World War II, there were about 75 million people died. Both of those wars, the majority of people who died were not soldiers. They were civilians. They got caught up in the war, and many millions of soldiers also died. There are more than 40 active conflicts today in our world. Most of the time we don't hear of all of them, but Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, Kenya, Congo, North, Northern India, Chechnya, uh, Mexico, and, and there are over 40 active conflicts, some of them with over 10,000 deaths a year, many of them not as many, and some even more than that. So today we're in the middle of wars and rumors of wars. Here's the third thing, famine. According to the United States, uh, I mean the United uh, Nations News and World Food Program, 957 million people in 93 countries do not have enough food to eat. 41 million people are at the edge of, of famine. In Somalia alone in 2011, 260,000 people died of hunger. Today, 584,000 people are experiencing famine in Ethiopia, Madagascar, Sudan, and Yemen. Now, why are we having all this famine? Well, the number one thing is because of war. Now, if you follow this, uh, uh, this line that Jesus gave, so war is rumors of war, the next product is famine. If you go to chapter 6 of Revelation, when Jesus begins to break the seals, this same sequence follows Matthew chapter 24. So after the wars, we have famine. Now, some of the reasons that we have famine is weather conditions, natural events, uh, insect in, infestation, plant diseases, economic conditions, uh, soaring food prices, wars, civil wars, Muslim terrorism, socialism, communism. When they tell you socialism and communism is going to help you, it's a lie. Six. Out of the last 10 major world famines happened in socialistic and communistic countries. Six of the last 10. There's reasons for that. Countries such as Venezuela, Cuba, and North Korea right now are in distress. How many of you have watched the protest in Cuba the last few weeks? So there are Cubans that are coming out of decades of socialism and communism that are waving American flags while we in democracy are burning America flags. How dumb can we be? 
And you don't hear the national media talking about that a lot because that's what socialism has done to Venezuela and Cuba and Central America and China and Russia. It has never worked in any country, in any decade, in any century, and we're propagating that in schools and universities, and our young people are buying it hook, line, and sinker. You want to know how I really feel about it? Because it is a lie. And so we have to realize that it is absolutely not of God. Can I hear an amen? Haiti continues to be and has the highest level of hunger in the Western Hemisphere. And if you know anything about the history of Haiti, it was actually founded on witchcraft. It's true. It was actually founded on witchcraft. Here's the fourth sign, pestilence. Now, I found this to be interesting, a worldwide COVID-19 deaths as of July 22nd. Worldwide was 4,147,246. So we have over 4 million COVID deaths. So the country with the highest number of COVID deaths, according to reports, is the United States, 625,852. Now, this is China's number. How many of you know China? This is where it began. Now, we, we have about 333 million people. China has 1.5 or 6 million people, a billion people, I'm sorry. 1.5, 1.6 billion people. You, you know how many COVID deaths they reported? 4,636. How many of you believe that? So that's where it started. So they've reported since July 22nd of this year, since the outbreak of COVID, only 4,636 deaths in 1.6 billion people. Well, let's go back to point number one, deception. I mean, they're not reporting their, their accurate numbers of deaths. So they're allowing us to think that, you know, that they've got it under control. Um, let me give you this uh, article. COVID-19 will not be the world's last pandemic. Many of us even will live to see the next one, but we're unlikely to be any more prepared for it than we were for this one. That's the opinion of Dr. Kenneth Iserson, Professor Emeritus of Emergency Medicine at University of Arizona. He specializes in global and disaster medicine. The world has already seen a number of new diseases that could potentially develop into disease X, Dr. Iserson told this uh, news organization. There are probably other unrecognized infectious diseases already in circulation that can have devastating implica uh, implications. The likelihood of severe infection disease that is still unknown to humans, disease X, which he's saying will be the next one, we don't have a name for it yet, uh, is one of dozens of deathly uh, pathogens including the severe acute respiratory uh, syndromes of SARS, Ebola, that the World Health Organization uh, deems top research priorities. Uh, COVID-19 is the disease X that plant plunged the world into crisis in 2021, but as nations roll out vaccines developed for that, the new one will be coming and lurking on the horizon. And, and we know that. So Jesus said there will be pestilence. Here's the fifth thing. The fifth thing will be earthquakes. We have already, in 2021, had 8,826 earthquakes of 4.0 magnitude in 2021. In 2020, the total was 13,654. So we're already on pace to out, you know, number uh, last year's. Now this fluctuates up and down. Some studies show that we have about a half a million earthquakes a year, but most of them we cannot, we cannot feel them. So the earth is rumbling, and the earth is moving. And Romans chapter 8 says that the creation is groaning and having birth pains. Now, ladies, you're an expert at this. This is what happens when you have labor pains. They start out not quite as severe, they're further apart, 
But the closer you get to delivery, what happens? They get closer together and they get more intense. And ladies, you could have amen me there. I, I'm just, you know, telling you this is the way it works. Uh, we guys, we, we're, we're not really familiar with that, although I did go in with Carrie uh, with uh, some of the childbirthing of, of our kids. And it wasn't a pleasant experience for me, and it sure wasn't pleasant for her uh, because she decided she was going to have natural childbirth. Uh, no drugs, no uh, epidural. It's just going to be bite the leather strap and, and just have, you know, the baby. And so about, oh, 15 minutes before childbirth, she looked at me and she said, tell them to give me something right now and um, I was in the delivery room and I had my scrubs on and had my feet covered my cap on and my mask on and all she could see was my eyes but she looked at me and she said get over here I know that's you she said I, I told you to tell them to give me something right now and I said honey uh, they said it was too late and Boy, the look she gave me was not lovely. So if the earth is in labor pains, and that's what the Bible says, the earth is in labor pains. So what are those labor pains? Well, these are the labor pains. And the closer we get to the coming of Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? The, these things are going to be more frequent. They're going to be more severe. And then we're going to see the fruition of a new heaven, a new world, new earth coming and the old one, according to Scripture, is going to pass away. And, and the Bible says that the earth is going through those labor pains. And we're going to see them become more severe as we go forward. So, number six, the sixth sign he gives us is tribulation and martyrdom. So this is Matthew 24, verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. If you uh, follow this, and I don't follow it very closely, but, but I did some research. And there's a lot of debate on this, so I just want you to know. This is from the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary by Dr. Todd Johnson. He's a professor of global Christianity and missions. He said, Christian persecution has captured the imagination of the media mostly because of the tragedy occurring in the Middle East. Stories of struggling Christians have been highlighted by The Economist, Boston Globe, The Republic, the BBC. We estimate that more than 70 million Christians have been martyred over the last 2,000 years. 70 million. He said more than half of which have died in the 20th century under fascist and communist regimes. We also estimate that one million Christians were killed between 2001 and 2010, and about 900,000 Christians were killed from 2011 to 2020. It's one of the most persecuted people groups on the face of the earth. Should that shock us? Jesus told us it would happen, didn't he? He said it's going to be a sign. And when I hear people, and you've heard me say this over and over again, when I hear people say, well, you know, the church won't go through any tribulation. Well, I believe we won't go through the great tribulation, but the church has always gone through tribulation. There was tribulation in the Bible. I mean, Stephen, the first martyr that we have recorded there in the book of Acts. We have churches that were persecuted. We still have churches that are being burnt down today by Muslim extremists. In China, I just saw a video where they actually demolished a huge church just as they would demolish a building they're trying to move from a site they actually set explosives because this church was not officially quote registered with the government and they literally imploded that huge church to get it out of the way so places like china russia the middle east especially africa the christian communities are under extreme persecution and Jesus said that would be the way it is. And I believe, and whether you want to believe it or not, here in America, we're going to see some more of it. Uh, I think we saw a little bit of it through COVID-19. 
Not that there should have been some things done to mitigate the, the disease and the infection rate, but some of it went far beyond that. Some of it began to be political. Some of it began to be, we're in control, you're not in control. And there's even churches still today that are shut down when other places have opened up, liquor stores, strip joints are essential, but churches are not. I mean, I mean, how, how, do you even, how, how do you even justify that? That is absolutely a control by people who are anti-God, anti-church, and against the church. So we know that those things have happened. I believe that they're going to be ramping up. I think that we are blessed to live where we live. I think we're blessed to live in the community we live. And I think we're blessed to have the leadership in this church that is watching out for these things and will stand up for these things. I'll tell you a little episode that happened locally and I won't mention any names, but uh, there, there was a, a, an issue and there's some people in this room that was part of this. Uh, we had a, a, a local community prayer session not too many weeks ago and uh, our district attorney over here helped uh, organize that. And there was uh, some uh, issues with uh, some of the civic and, and community uh, issues that uh, we had to do some things that would allow this to happen. And we felt like that we didn't have to do that. And uh, so we decided, well, we're going to do it anyway. And our mayor, uh, who's a member of our church, uh, said, well, if I was you, I'd do it anyway. And in that meeting... Uh, I asked our district attorney, I said, uh, if we do this, are you going to prosecute us? And he said, I'm not going to. And there were several police officers that were actually in that meeting. And I said, guys, are you going to come and arrest us? This is what they said. No, we may stop and pray with you. Don't you love it? I mean, that, that's an actual true uh, happening right here locally. And then our mayor went to the city council and some of the city officials and said, uh, I, I think you need to drop this because I don't think you want all the pastors in town up here, uh, you know, dealing with this with you. And they said, you're right, let, let's drop this. But there's going to come a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph along. I mean, you know what I'm saying? There's going to come someone along and they're going to start pressing it, they're going to start pushing it. And that's where we as a church, that's where we as the people of God, and we heard this and we, we're going to reinforce this, that the Bible says we should obey the laws of the land, but there is a higher law, and that law is the law of God. And so should we obey Caesar or should we obey God? And there's a point where you say God trumps Caesar and this is the direction we're going to go. Now there may be some ramifications for that and, and, uh, and we're going to have to maybe deal with that. But I think we as a church and leaders in this community and leaders in this church, we're going to have to be very careful that we honor whom honor is due. We obey what we can, but if it gets to the point where we have to say we've got to follow the word of God and the people of God are going to do what God wants them to do, then God's going to win every time. Now, this is not anything new to the church. Matter of fact, if you've ever read the book of Acts, this was thematic through the book of Acts. Should we obey God or should we obey men? And the, the mandate coming down was, I don't want you to preach or teach in his name anymore. And guess what those disciples, those apostles did? They said... We, we can't do that. We're going to teach and preach in his name. And how many of you glad they did that? That's how we got to where we are today. Now, here's the seventh sign that we have. The love of many will grow cold. Verse 12. And because lawlessness will, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. It is not shocking to you, it's not shocking to me, that in America... We are living in a post-Christian nation. It used to be, and many of you know this, when you went to school, you prayed. You saluted the flag. Most people, uh, at some time or another, tried to attend church, and many did that on a regular basis. 
I can remember years ago, we did not even lock our church. Because people would come, they might pray, uh, they, they come in the door. Now you have to lock the church, ring to get in, and have security cameras. Um, you, you may not know this, but recently we had people come and cut some of the exhaust systems off of our vehicles over here in, in the parking lot of our church. There's no respect for the sanctity of the church or God, uh, not even the sanctity of life, but uh, we're living in a day today that uh, people have just drifted away, and as the Bible says, the love of many has grown cold. Europe has already gone that way. Uh, I was in Europe a few years ago, and most of the churches, the cathedrals now are either museums, uh, tourist attractions, or they park bicycles in them. Because most of them they don't even use anymore, because people aren't going to church. So we, we know that there are the love of many waxing cold. Here's the eighth sign he gives, the preaching of the gospel to all the world. Now this is exciting to me, because you and I are part of that. Um, Tanner can give us some better statistics, but uh, the last that I heard, we were in close to 20 different countries that our podcast and our services are viewed and heard over the world. Yeah, that is good, isn't it? And we, we have had, I think, well over 30,000 different people to listen to our services. I, I shared with this with you a couple of times. Uh, when we were down on uh, 2nd Street, a friend of mine came to preach for us, and during that service, he had a word, a prophetic word for us, and he said, in the future, Ray of Hope Church will become a nation-shaking church. And I thought, well, I, I, I'm going to hear that and receive that. I don't know how that's going to happen. We can't hardly even pay the light bill. Uh, you know, we're, we're just trying to get through here. We're in a floodplain. We're by the railroad track. And now you're prophesying we're going to be a nation-shaking church. Uh, you, how many of you know you got to take that by faith? Well, today we're heard, you know, in multiple countries, uh, now on, you know, YouTube, uh, you know, uh, live broadcast. Uh, we have people that watch all of the United States. We have people who watch in other countries. And, uh, and that's a good thing. And many churches are doing that. So the gospel is going far beyond the walls of the church. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. Now, I, I pulled this up today. Uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators, most of you have heard of them. The full Bible is now available in 704 different languages, giving 5.7 billion people access to Scripture in the language they understand the best. The New Testament is available in another 1,551 languages, reaching another 815 million people. Selections and stories of the Bible are available in a further 1,160 languages spoken by five, uh, 458 million people. So how many other people need languages and that translation in their language? There are currently 3,945 languages with no scripture. That's 167 million people speaking 2,014 languages. They still need a translation work for their language. This is an article from the Wycliffe Bible Translators and the Denver Post. They have suggested by 2025... How many of you know that's four years from now? By 2025, most languages will now have the gospel. And they say the reason it's accelerating is because of computers and satellites. Now, I'm not making a prediction here. I'm just saying what the article says. They said within about four years, nearly every language group will have access to to part of or some of the Word of God. And this is what Jesus said. 
when the gospel is preached to the whole world, he said, then the end will come. Now, I don't know about you, but that is pretty exciting. Now, these are the signs of his coming. And I want to end here just in a few minutes, the sequence of his coming. Say that with me. The sequence of his coming. Now, those were the signs. Here's the sequence. Many verses share with us the sequence. We see it in the book of Thessalonians. We see it through Peter's writing. We see it through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Bible says there's going to come a day that Jesus is going to come in the clouds just as he left in the clouds in Acts chapter 1. This same Jesus that you've seen go shall come again in like manner. So what's going to happen? Well, we call that the catching away or the rapture. So if you don't like the word rapture, that's okay. It's not a biblical word, but it means the snatching away very quickly or the catching away. So Jesus is going to come back for his people. Believers are going to be snatched up, caught up, received up in the air, in the clouds, to be with Jesus. Paul says it this way in the book of Thessalonians. He said, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And the them is, he says, I don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant, brethren. He said, for the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Someone asked, well, why are the dead rising first? Well, they got further to go than we do. So anyway, they got a six-foot trip further. So uh, that didn't cost anything. But uh, anyway, the dead in Christ rise first. Then those who are alive will be caught up with the dead, and we're going to be with Christ in glory. Now, where are the dead now? The Bible says to be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. So their uh, consciousness, their soul, their spirit is with the Lord right now. But they don't have their glorified body yet, so that body is going to be resurrected. And Paul said this way, he said it's going to be in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He said the, the, the terrestrial shall put on the celestial, the mortal shall be putting on immor immortality. And so that, that natural body is going to be changed into a celestial body. And for all of you and for me who are going to be alive, if we are at the coming of Jesus, in the twinkling of an eye, your body is going to be changed. And that sounds okay for me. Because some mornings I get up and I think, that would be all right. You know, uh, I wouldn't have aches and pains and issues. And, you know, the outward man is perishing day by day. But the inward man is being renewed day by day. So uh, th that inner man and that, that, that soul and spirit you have, that, that's the part that's going to go with, be with Jesus if you die. But let me tell you, you're going to have a body that's going to last throughout eternity. And so that's part of the sequence. So there's going to be a catching away. We're going to go in the clouds. We're going to be with Jesus. Now, I believe this is my personal opinion. I believe Scripture points that out. Uh, this is what Paul says as he end, ended that chapter. He said, now comfort one another with these words. So as we face the last days, we should be comforted. The Bible says the coming of Jesus Christ is our blessed hope. It's not our blessed fear, it's our blessed hope. And I believe this, as we see the world going the direction it's going, that you're going to begin to cry out Maranatha, which means, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And uh, I'm sure everybody has done this at one time or another. You probably said, Lord, this would be a good day for you to come. <laughs> so there, there is going to be a day where we look and we should be doing that now, but as we see these days and these signs approaching, then we also see the sequence of how they're going to unfold. So I believe the next major thing that we're looking for is the coming of Jesus Christ to catch away believers off the face of the earth. Now, are some things maybe needing to happen before them? Probably so. But I know this, we don't know the day nor the hour when he's coming 
And he said, and we read it earlier, he said, I'm coming quickly. And those believers, they were concerned about that because Paul even had to write a letter to the church at Thessalonica. He said, don't be shaken by word or by some letter that someone's written you that the day of the Lord has already come. And he begins to tell them, these things have to happen before he comes. But I want to tell you, these signs that I just gave you tonight are already happening today. So we're not looking for this, bim, this big bombastic thing. We're seeing the continual signs coming forth. And the sequence is going to be the signs come and then we're caught away, we're caught up to be with the Lord. Now what happens when we get there? Well, the Bible says there's going to be a supper. There's going to be a marriage. And it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you and I are going to have these white robes. They're called the robe of righteousness that we're going to wear to that dinner. How many of you know all God's people need to be dressed up <laughs> for the right dinner? And the Bible tells us that, they are, that we are going to be given, given robes of righteousness and that righteousness also, also would be the righteousness of God because you don't have any and I don't have any except what has been given to us. And that's why righteousness in Revelation is compared to a robe and righteousness in the natural in the Old Testament is compared to rags. You get it? So the rags are your righteousness, the robe is his righteousness, but you get to wear his righteousness. So you're taking off yours and putting on his. You're the prodigal that's coming home, stinky, filthy, with dirty clothes, but the father takes the robe and puts on you and recognizes you as the son or the daughter of Almighty God. Wow, that gives me God bumps just thinking about that. So, sequence, rapture, marriage supper of the Lamb. So what happens when we are in heaven with the Lord? What happens on the earth? Well, according to Scripture, it's not going to be good. The Bible says the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the earth for a sinful world. Now you say, well, why would God do that? The same reason he did it back in Genesis chapter 6. He looked at the earth. He saw some righteous. He took them from that destruction, got them through that. And then the rest of the people began to perish. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the rapture, the catching away, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And those who are left here on this earth are going to go through a very, very difficult time, and it's called the Great Tribulation. Now, the Great Tribulation is going to be a horrific time of the wrath of God being poured out in many different ways. Not only is there wars and rumors of wars that are going to continue, not only is there going to be famine that continues, pestilence that continues, but the Bible talks about the fresh water being polluted, seawater being polluted, talks about signs in the heavens, talks about a burning mountain that's going to come and hit the earth and change our landscape as we know it. I read recently of how many different asteroids are in our uh, solar system just in close proximity to the earth, and some of those could be game-changing asteroids that could hit the earth the bible says the sun is going to be changed the moon is going to be changed the water is going to be changed the vegetation is going to be changed sea life is going to die would you agree with me you'd rather not be here when that happens i'd rather be with the lord wouldn't you i'd rather be already in heaven and not experiencing the wrath of god on this earth and the only way that you and I can move beyond the wrath of God is to be caught up with the saints because we have given our heart and our life to Jesus Christ. Our, our faith is in Him. Um, 
Matt and I had this discussion the other day. I don't remember it, but he reminded me. He said, he said I thought about what you said, uh, you know, maybe two or three years ago. He said that every person ought to have at least a 30-day supply of food in their house. I, I believe that. Now, I don't know how you do that. I'm not saying to be out the ultimate prepper, but that's okay, too. Um, in my lifetime, I can remember going without electricity for weeks at a time because we lived out in the country. I can remember just not too long ago right here in this sanctuary, we went a month without electricity right here uh, on this hill. He said, what happened? We had a massive ice storm. Does anybody remember that time? And uh, let me tell you where churches were prioritized. We were last on the list so after week after week after week I said we're having church and we had church in here with no lights no heat it was 40 degrees in here we tried to heat it before everybody came and we, we put the word out we we said dress like you're coming to a football game and people had their coats and their scarves and their gloves and I think we had three or four hundred people here with no lights, no electricity, with, with no heat. And listen, if you can go to a football game like that, you can come and worship God. That's just my view. Because after week after week after week, I said, this is ridiculous. We're, we're having church. And so that, that's why I say things like that, not because I'm trying to alarm you. I'm just telling you, we need to be prepared. And uh, I, I was uh, without electricity here a few days ago. We had a little storm that came through. I was joking with Mark and Debbie and some of them. Uh, for we live, we live seven miles out in the country. And I was telling Danny and some of them, our, our, our electrical line comes from Sugden, Oklahoma. Does anybody know where Sugden, Oklahoma is? There, there's not much in Sugden, Oklahoma. And because I'm on that line, let me tell you something. I'm not a very high priority on Cotton Electric's list. Now everybody else is, but, but we're not. So sometimes everybody else has electricity, we don't. If they don't have it, theirs came on, ours don't. Finally we get it. But the world as we know it is going to radically change, and especially after the rapture, after the catching away, and when the great tribulation happens, the world is going to look nothing like what it looked like before. And that's why we have to be prepared and be ready. And I'm not here to scare you. I'm just here to prepare you. And uh, I, I think we need to filter it. I think we need to look at it. So there's the coming, the catching away, the great tribulation. And then here's the last sequence I want to give you tonight. Then there is the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. So the first is what? The catching away where Christ is in the air. The second is, when he comes down, Zechariah talks about this, that his feet are going to land on the Mount of Olives, and he is going to come back to this earth, and he's going to rule and reign for 1,000 years. If I ask you where he left from, you know what you're going to tell me? He left from the Mount of Olives. That's why the angels there in Acts 1 said, This same Jesus that you've seen go shall come again in like manner. He left from the Mount of Olives, according to the Scripture. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. And when he was being tried, when he's being examined by the, uh, the rabbis, the Sanhedrin, by Pilate, by Herod, Jesus even made this response to some of them. He said, the next time you see me, I will not be this way. You know that he came the first time as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. The next time he comes, he will not come that way. The Bible says the next time he comes, he will come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And he will smite the nations with a rod of iron. And he'll come to rule and reign. There's a prophecy in the Bible that has yet to be fulfilled. And that's when the Lord told David that there will always be an heir on your throne. You may say, well, 
You know, we, we don't have an heir of David on the throne yet. Well, let me tell you, he's coming. And the heir of David is Jesus. And in the book of Acts, it talks about that that heir will be on the throne and Jesus is going to land on the Mount of Olives. He's going to cross the Kidron Valley. He's going to go back into Jerusalem. He's going to do what he said he'd do. He said, the next time you see me, I will not be coming this way. He said, I'll be coming in all of my glory and I'm going to be coming with the holy angels. And he's going to rule and reign on his father David's throne for a thousand years. And after that thousand years, we start eternity. That's the sequence. Now for us, eternity begins... Now, I want you to think about this. Don't throw anything at me. But for you, eternity began when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, I know your body, if the Lord tarries, is going to go to the grave. But your eternal life, your eternity began when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because you will never face the second death. You will never face the second death. I think it was Jason the other day said, if you're born twice, you only die once. If you're only born once, you die twice. You die a natural death, and you die eternal spiritual death. But if you're born again, you only die once. And after that, it's goodbye world, hello Jesus. And we get to be with him throughout eternity. I was listening to someone speak the other day, and he said, what concerns me in a lot of the emergent churches and the preachers today, you don't hear them speak much about last days. You don't hear them talk much about what happens in the end times. Not that we should harp on it service after service after service. Not that we should be apocalyptic in, in, in mentality all the time. But how many of you know we need to know what the future is we need to know what we're facing we need to know what the Bible says and the reason we need to know it is back to number one so we won't be deceived and if we're not deceived then we can we can progress we can assimilate you know all the things that are happening in a biblical context so that we can know what's happening around us and we can be ready for what is before us and what's before us is the coming of Jesus and if you don't know Christ tonight, you need to know him because you do not want to be left behind and you don't want to miss heaven as your home. And the only way you make heaven is through Jesus Christ.